from to uh, Disney something. Florida. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the last series in this year's Resident Scholar program. Tonight, we have the pleasure from hearing from Rabbi Simcha Willick, who amongst his many pursuits is finishing a PhD at NYU in Education and Jewish Studies. The series, which will span the next three lectures, will discuss the revolutionary educational philosophy of the Slavodka Yeshiva. Thank you, Rabbi Hellman. I am also grateful to Rabbi Rosenblatt and Rabbi Ganak for creating this opportunity and encouraging my participation. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of some friends and family, in particular my grandmother, Mrs. Margo Stern, and my father-in-law, Mr. Shimmy Stein, and the rest of the the rest of the crew that are here. If you came tonight expecting to hear a lecture about German philosophy, I apologize, there was a mistake and uh, on Schuldix. <clears throat> Over the next few weeks, I'll be uh, giving a few lectures that relate directly to my particular field of study. At the moment, I'm in the fourth year of a PhD program at NYU that merges the fields of education and Jewish studies. Since I matriculated, my focus has been on one specific yeshiva and the philosophy therein, the Slobodka Yeshiva. It was located in a small town near Kovna, and not this week, not next week, but the following week, uh, the lecture will be devoted to that specific philosophy, the story of the yeshiva and its impact on, uh, on a Jewry in North America. So this evening, we'll talk about the yeshiva. The yeshiva as it was established and as it evolves over the past 200 years, uh, what we'll call the modern yeshiva. Next week, God willing, we'll talk about the Musser movement and the history, the causes, the story, and the influence of that movement. And lastly, as I mentioned, the final week we'll talk about Slobodka, which was the yeshiva that merged both the Muslim movement and the yeshiva movement. The Volazhin yeshiva is the mother of all yeshivas in uh, modern times. Now, <clears throat> for thousands of years there have been yeshivas all over the world. Basically, any uh, country where there was a Jewish presence, there was a yeshiva. Through the times of uh, the Mishnah and the Gemara and the Gaonim, we have documentations of very clear and established institutions of Jewish study. Yeshiva literally means to sit. It was a place where people would come together, usually individuals who had other professions and pursuits. But they would come together to learn Torah. They would come together to study the Torah. <clears throat> However, what was unique about the Volazhin Yeshiva was its uh, revolutionary approach to a more modern model. That means to say, previously for hundreds of years, if not longer, any town that had a rabbi who was qualified, any rabbi that was a scholar, had the ability to create a yeshiva. Essentially, the rabbi of the town, with all of his other responsibilities, would also function as the leader of a yeshiva. The yeshiva would focus primarily on the youth of the town. When I say youth, <clears throat> a yeshiva would focus mostly on students that finished their early studies in Cheder. And this was a, a significantly smaller percentage of students who would go to earlier day school, let's say, or middle school. These are students who were post-bar mitzvah. And those who came from families of means or families that could support 
a few extra years of study before their sons would join the workforce, would send their sons to study with the rabbi in the base medrash or in the shul that was in any given town. Once in a while, if you would have a rabbi that was incredibly, incredibly scholarly, there would be some other students that would come to study with that rabbi in any given yeshiva. So what did Velazhin do? Well, very succinctly, Velazhin institutionalized the yeshiva model that people would come from all over to study in the yeshiva. So no longer was it focused on one leader, on one scholar, one uh, charismatic, charismatic personality. The yeshiva from then onward would become a place <clears throat> that existed in and of itself. What I mean to say is that you would have a place in a, in a city that would attract people to come learn in that place. Now, why is that different? Why is that important? <clears throat> well, the reason it's so different is because until that point, until 1803 when the yeshiva was established, and we'll get back to the establishment in a few minutes. Until that point, there was, it was not common to find a mass of students who would study together, grow together, challenge each other on a very high level because there weren't that many students in any given yeshiva. In addition, there was no continuity. So if there was a great scholar, an amazingly well-regarded sage in a, in a particular town, so people would be influenced by him, there would be students of his that he would at some point usually give smicha to if they would keep on studying. However, when he would pass or when he would retire, there would be no um, continuation of that yeshiva or definitely not as it was known until that point. So what Velazhin did and what every subsequent yeshiva has done is it established itself as a place for people to come from all over and find in the yeshiva a place to study. Yes, it was influenced quite significantly by the leader of the yeshiva that we refer to as a Rosh Yeshiva, but it wasn't only about him. And that shift is significant. Now, let's talk for a few minutes about the, the fellow who started this movement. His name is Rabbi Chaim of Velazhin, known as Rabbi Chaim Velazhiner. You don't have to be a genius to figure that one out. He was from the town of Velazhin, which was common back then to refer to people uh, by their hometown or where they uh, establish themselves. So <clears throat> the reason uh, that he was able to successfully pull this off, according to most scholars, is because he was undeniably the Gadol Hador. He was considered the number one uh, leader and scholar of the time. He was the primary student of the Gon of Vilna, who, uh, who died in 1797, I believe. And because he had that status, because he ruled on so many of the most significant uh, uh, questions and halakhic issues of the day, he had credibility. And he was, like any other rabbi who had a yeshiva, the, the, the chief rabbi in the town of Velazhin. So he started the yeshiva, like most other yeshivas, similarly. Okay, so there would be some students from uh, his specific area and from the areas around the city of Velazhin, who would come to learn with him, and that, that small uh, group of students grew. Nothing uh, too significant, but it grew. Once that happened, and once he saw that there was a nucleus of interested and capable students, he had this idea. The idea to establish a yeshiva. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of debate and uh, uh, many legends and stories about why the yeshiva was started. Uh, some modern scholars um, reject most of them, but for the importance of the tradition, I'll share a couple. One has to do with, uh, with the, the Vilna Gon. Some explain that the reason the yeshiva started right after the Gon's passing is because he, almost as a last wish, requested of his student, Rabbi Chaim of Velazhin, that a yeshiva be recreated. He asked that he recreate and allow for the rebirth of, uh, of Torah learning on, on that level. There's no indication, though, of such a thing. 
<clears throat> and it may or may not have happened, but there's no sources that can be found around the time of the yeshiva's establishment that would support that. Another idea, and this gets uh, more uh, complicated, is that the yeshiva was a reaction. Okay? What could it be a reaction to? Anyone want to guess what the yeshiva movement may have been a reaction to? Excellent. Yes and yes. So some suggest the yeshiva was there to combat the growing uh, influence of the, of the Hasidim. Now, why would that be? So without getting uh, into too much detail, many a Hasidic community focused on things other than Torah study. They focused on uh, davening and on singing and on what they called the Vekas. However, there was, according to some scholars, a, a dramatic decline in Torah scholarship that the yeshiva could have been a response to. Others explain that the Haskalah was uh, just beginning then, but it was already having some influence, and the yeshiva was there to, uh, to, uh, to negate the, the influence of the Haskalah. Now, without getting involved into all the details and all the proofs and the rejections of those proofs, neither of those seem to be uh, particularly accepted. Uh, the, the latter because the timing is off. I mean, the Yeshiva started in 1803 and the Haskalah began sometime before them, but the influence of the Haskalah wasn't really felt so significantly at that point in time. Now, as far as the Hasidic issue, so Stamfer spends quite some time, and he is really the chief historian on Lithuanian Yeshivas, tried to prove that Rav Chaim Volozhin had a very, very positive attitude uh, toward Hasidim and that he worked very closely with some of the leaders of the movement. So, even though some reject Stanford's proof, he seems to feel, uh, based on some collaborative work that Rav Chaim Volozhin actually had with some of the leaders uh, in, the, in, the, in the movement, that that's, that is not a logical approach to take. Now, you can quibble here or there. The, longest, the long story short, if you look at the letter that was sent out by Rav Chaim, when he started this yeshiva, he talks of uh, scholarship. And that's what we're going to be focusing on, at least for the backdrop, for the remainder of uh, the talk tonight. The value of having scholarly Jews. The value of having a Jewish community of people that are not ignorant, people that are knowledgeable and well-read in Jewish texts. Now, many people, if not everyone in this room, is, um, are, are capable of reading Hebrew, uh, writing Hebrew. That was not at all the case by anyone's standards, by any stretch of the imagination, at the time, meaning in the 19th century or the 20th century, um, in, in the European communities. People just didn't know. So, <clears throat> even the people who knew Many of them knew a little bit more. They knew a little bit of Chumash. They knew a little bit of Gemara, maybe. They knew a little bit of Medrash. But there was not a culture of, of study that bred or allowed for real scholarship. Um, if not a complete mastery, but any kind of uh, comfort level with advanced texts such as, as the Talmud. So... <clears throat> Everyone seems to agree that this was a component, meaning the need to build up the, the level of Torah learning. However, there's a big debate as to what exactly it was a response to. And in that sense, the yeshiva movement is different than the Muslim movement, which we'll talk about next week. The Muslim movement seems to be very clear as to why it was established. And we'll get to that, I hope, next week. But as far as the yeshiva, it's interesting to note there is not necessarily something or any particular... Uh, situation or scenario, and definitely no story that it was, it was, it was responding to. Now, another unique characteristic of the, of, of the Velazhny Yeshiva was that it was detached from the community. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll be walking around a little bit if that's okay. Excuse the picture. Because every yeshiva was in a town and the rabbi was the rosh yeshiva, the yeshiva was supported by the townspeople. 
So if let's say there were six or seven or 16 or 17 students in the yeshiva, the way the yeshiva was supporting me, the way the students were able to live is they would eat at the people in the town. The way the yeshiva students were able to live is they would sleep in the homes of the people in the town. The Slobodki yeshiva re-envisioned what a yeshiva could be. And that's why it's so significant. It had a separate area of the town where the yeshiva was built, especially after there was a fire there. They really uh, created a, a, a separate settlement almost within the city of Elijah. And they worked to create independence. They wanted the students to eat together as much as possible. They wanted the, the students to, uh, to sleep with the yeshiva students or in the yeshiva. In fact, uh, Shaul Stamfer has an entire article where he talks of the uh, influence of dormitories on the yeshiva community. It's really fascinating to understand that before Volazhin, there was no model of a yeshiva in and of itself. It was really something that was part of the town. Now, there were a lot of benefits to that, financial especially, because if you had a small yeshiva, it wasn't too hard to support it, and the economics were such that it was part and parcel of the community, especially if the rabbi was well known, it would be the feather in the cap of the community, they would want to make sure that they could sustain and, and maintain that, that yeshiva. However, um, Velazhin was the first yeshiva that needed to fundraise. Because they accepted students and recruited students from all over, and there were students that would come to Velazhin from literally all over Europe, they needed to find other sources of, uh, of funds. Another advantage, though, is that when you, as a yeshiva, raise your own money, as opposed to being beholden to the leaders of a community, you have an easier time establishing policy. And that's something we'll, we'll hopefully have time to touch on later, the politics involved in a yeshiva. And that definitely is an issue. So if you had a, a small yeshiva in a small town and there was some issue that was... Uh, P pertaining to the yeshiva, running the yeshiva, any, any concern or any problem that emerged, the townspeople and the leaders of the community had a say. They could tell the rabbi X, they could tell the rabbi Y, or suggest to the rabbi Z. The idea of the Velazhin yeshiva is that the yeshiva has an administration in and of itself that's independent of the town. The yeshiva is able to chart its own, uh, its own journey and uh, create an environment where the students could focus on what the yeshiva leaders want the students to focus on, and that alone. But they needed money. So the Velazhin yeshiva established a system of uh, mishulachim, or shtadlanim. So if you get anyone knocking on your door, you can uh, attribute that to the Velazhin yeshiva. Now, <clears throat> Stanford points out that in the, in the late 1700s, there were some of these emissaries that were sent to collect funds, but for one purpose and one, person, one purpose only. Anyone want to guess? It's a much harder question. Israel? Correct. Excellent. It was a monopoly. The only people that would travel around to different cities were the people that would be raising funds for any particular project or just Israel and the, the, the building up of the country in general. Fascinating. And there was a lot of um, discomfort with the Velazhin Yeshiva kind of um, uh, getting into a market that had previously been exclusive. But that's how they, that's how they raised their funds mostly. They would, stand, they would send shtadlanim, people who would be paid to go to different towns and different cities and different areas um, throughout, throughout Europe, who would collect money every year most of the time to every town. Um, and with that money, the yeshiva would be able uh, to survive. Interesting, there was actually Din Torah. There was uh, a significant issue that uh, reached the Jewish courts when other yeshivas wanted to start sending mishulachim. And that's a fascinating uh, historical piece of information where this was so successful, and we look today and we see that it is, uh, that the Velazhin yeshiva wanted the monopoly on the yeshiva fundraising. Anyhow, it's for a longer discussion, but that is how they, um, that's how they uh, created and maintained the yeshiva, and that's how they sustained themselves. <clears throat> now, what was the actual goal, or what were the actual goals of the yeshiva? Uh, a couple moments ago, I explained the yeshiva really cherished 
their independence. They wanted to be separate. They wanted to create something that they felt could be uh, better created or more realistically created if they were somewhat detached from the community. So what did they want to create? What did the yeshiva want to do and did they do it? Well, <clears throat> we'll start with the negative. Many people assume that the purpose of yeshiva is to make rabbis. Well, in the Volusian yeshiva that was not the case, and even today it's not the case, it's kind of like the square and the rectangle. Every square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square. So almost any rabbi you'll find learns in yeshiva, but not everybody who learns in yeshiva becomes a rabbi. In fact, most people who learn in yeshivas do not become rabbis. So what's the purpose of yeshiva? Well, <clears throat> this issue has been dealt with quite a bit in scholarship in different arenas. Sociology, psychology, history, philosophy. But this point is one that I've had a very hard time explaining to people who are unfamiliar with the Jewish community, um, and especially people who are not Jewish. It has to do with the idea of, uh, of Torah Lishma. Rav Chaim uh, had in his most significant work, his magnum opus called the Nefesh HaChaim, he outlined his philosophy of Judaism. And it was a very clear, maybe subtle, but a very clear attack on, on, the, on Hasidism. He really felt strongly that they were taking away the, the ultimate value of Torah and Torah study from the Jewish community at the time. And he develops for, for quite some bit in his work this notion of Torah Lashma, which is borrowed from a mission in Perkei right? Kala Osik Torah Lashma, Zochel Advar Harbe. So what is Torah Lashma? Literally, what do the words mean? Anyone? It's hard to translate, so don't feel pressure. Torah Lashma. For its own sake. Torah Lishma. For its own sake. So Torah for itself, Torah for its own sake. Excellent. Well, <coughs> these suggestions are reflected in a number of interpretations, but interpretations abound. Is it Torah for the sake of learning Torah? Torah for the sake of becoming a better Jew? Torah for the sake of understanding God? Maybe for the sake of God, for the sake of the Torah? It's a very complex matter. He deals with that in his, in his book, in Nefesh HaChaim. But one thing is clear, and this is something that is crucial to the philosophy of, of the yeshiva movement, that Velazhin, led by Rabbi Chaim, wanted to impart to the Jewish community, directly and indirectly, that Torah is something that is valuable in and of itself for every Jew. Torah Lishma. And it's not something that's uh, exclusive to the, uh, the rabbinic families or to the elite. It's something that everyone should have access to. Which is another reason that Rabbi Chaim Volazhin established the yeshiva. He wanted, and he wrote this in his, in his open letter to the Jewish community in 1803, he wanted every single Jew, and at the time it was only Jewish men, yes, he wanted to make sure that they would have an opportunity to learn Torah. And therefore, any financial concerns were addressed. Either they would have a free, free ride, they would not need to pay tuition, or sometimes they would even get a stipend, something we'll talk about in a couple of weeks too. But he wanted to make sure that any Jewish child at the time would have the ability to learn Torah. So what's so special about this learning Torah? You're creating rabbis all over. All over you hear is there's schools that have rabbinical. There's uh, um, there's Nair Israel Rabbinical College. That's the yeshiva that I know quite well. There's uh, the Rabbinical Seminary of America. Anyone know what yeshiva that is? The Rabbinical Seminary of America? The yeshiva in Queens called Chavetz Chaim, right? So everywhere you look, it seems like it's about rabbis, but it's really not. It's about Torah Lashma. So what's Torah Lashma? What's this idea of Torah Lashma? What, is, what does it mean to say, and what impact does it have on the Jewish community? Um, as, as, uh, as created by a yeshiva. So what is it all about? Well, it seems to be about 
a profound and profounder and then more profound understanding of Torah. Torah, mostly through the Gemara, through the Talmud, the idea here is that the more you study, the more you understand, it's very knowledge-centric, the more you comprehend, the more you're able to create uh, an understanding of the breadth of the Torah, the more elevated you are as a person, the more elevated you are as a Jew. And that seems to be, with different iterations, the goal of the yeshiva, to create uh, Torah-oriented people who have both knowledge and perspective that is uh, rooted in, in Torah foundations. Well, <clears throat> that seems to be one very important goal of the yeshiva. Another important goal is the idea of uh, valuing Torah study and learning. Meaning, there were plenty of Torah scholars before the yeshiva. The idea of the yeshiva is to give the Jewish community a sense that uh, there's value in Torah study. So this is slightly different than the first point, which is all about accessibility, and this is showing the, the value of Torah study. Um, one direct, or some might argue indirect, goal or benefit of that is to create a B'nai Torah. What does B'nai Torah mean? Literally means um, people who are of the Torah, but <coughs> what it means in this context